so dr uh, sobia basically we have most of the participants who are uh, on the junior level like they are mostly residents but some of our consultants they also join in uh, what uh, basically we do we uh, at the end of the presentation or your talk we will be taking the questions from mainly from the residents and then from the consultants as well or if some consultants they have their uh, experience they usually share it with the uh, speakers so um, i will request you after a few minutes because you know we have uh, most of our participants they have been joining these lectures for almost a year now so we know that our participants will join in within 5 to 10 minutes and we'll wait for them and then you can start your presentation and i'll give you a go ahead for that So uh, you want me to join around to you know start around uh, seven forty or so? Yes, we will wait for another two to three minutes because now we have approximately eighteen participants. Uh, so by when they would be around twenty or maybe in the next two to three minutes, you can start, and then most of the participants they will be joining in in between. All right. So, so I'll start yeah. at seven forty. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sobia, you uh, you may start now and then, you know, rest of the participants, they will be joining later. All right. All right. So thank you so very much, Dr. Asma, for giving me, me this opportunity to share uh, something or other, other about the updates on labor and GCL. And uh, for the people who who know me, obviously I don't need to introduce myself, but since I'm not seeing each and every one of you, I would like to introduce myself that I am Dr. Sobia Khan and I work as assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at Arkhan University Hospital. And I'm really um, you know, thankful for the PSA forum to give me this opportunity to have a, a talk with you guys, right? right? So let's start. Okay, so first of all, um, I would like to share the roadmap of my talk and you can see that we will start with the background, little bit of background about the labor analgesia, then I will touch upon the epidural very briefly upon the ultra use of ultrasound in labor analgesia, we will uh, discuss combined spinal epidural, dural puncture epidural, continuous epidural infusions, PCEAs, PIEBs and CSA. And as you may have been seeing that I have highlighted or I have used a different color with the initials of these, uh, uh, whatever I have written here. Why? Because in most of the literature, because of the, you know, the long sentences, they tend to use abbreviations. So whenever you will search, you will get the articles which will be talking about CSA and PIEB and PCEA. So it would be nice that we uh, read these terms and make the abbreviations kind of our friend for the rest of the presentation. We all know that for the sake of providing analgesia to a laboring woman, there are many techniques around which have been uh, in use since decades and decades in different parts of the world, right? So there are many non-pharmacological methods and there are pharmacological methods. The scope of my presentation presentation is not to go into the detail of these non-pharmacological or even to the most of these pharmacological methods. So I will limit myself to the areas where I would like to, uh, you know, share the update with you guys. Okay. So these are tested and tried, which uh, in, in some parts of the world, for example, in UK, they tend to give the, uh, the, uh, the, the round balls to the laboring women. So there are different practices in different areas of the world. Regarding the pharmacological methods, we know that we have inhalational agents available. We have uh, uh, opioids available, which can be used intravenously or intramuscularly, and we have local anesthetics available. 
with this background i am sharing the slide which is which says that now the who recommends epidural analgesia for pain relief during the labor and and in this part of the world in pakistan where we are residing we know that still still even it's 2023 there are very few centers which routinely offer labor epidural to the parturients right in some places it is routine but in others sometimes it is offered sometimes the expertise is not available sometimes the equipment is not available so we are quite a mix and match and so far at our national level the uh, policy decision as well. And you may uh, be noticing that at the end of the slide, it is written that epidural is recommended for healthy pregnant women, women's preference. And you may be seeing the arrow I'm making published here on 29th August 2021, right? So now it is the part of food foundation. Why who has recommended it? What, uh, you know, propelled the WHO to cast this recommendation here? It is based upon the several studies which were published in recent decades. For example, it is about association of epidural analgesia in women in labor with neonatal and childhood outcomes in population cohort, right? And this was published in 20. Uh, in 2018 okay the objective was to investigate the association of labor epidural analgesia with neonatal first thousand days of life and what they found out and what they did that uh the epidural analgesia in labor is or middle out why i am sharing you know the huge uh, name with you guys if you are practicing labor epidural in your setups or if you're planning to start labor epidural in your setup then then you should be prepared for the answers which those women will ask you and obviously as uh, women they will be concerned not only with themselves but also the child they're going to give birth to so so it is safely said that epidural doesn't have any adverse effect on the neonatal or on the childhood outcome and this is a large scale study because it was done on about 4 lakh 35000 singleton live births in Scotland between 2007 and 2016. So it is a huge data. Then this was the, um, you know, study which was published in Cochrane Library. And you know, the Cochrane is respected whenever something is published over there because it is after the very thoughtful um, uh, research and very strict criteria that it gets to publish at the Cochrane database. And the title of this study is Epidural versus Non-Epidural or No Analgesia for Pain Management and Labor. It is a review. And authors conclude that epidural analgesia is more effective in reducing pain during labor and increasing the maternal satisfaction with the pain relief as compared to the non-epidural methods. And we all know what the non-epidural methods are because we use them. Overall, there appears to be an increase in assistant vaginal birth. But then what they did, they conducted a post hoc subgroup analysis and which showed that this is not the case in all those studies which were conducted after 2005. And you know why? Because after 2005, the recommendations, the strong recommendations were to use the dilute local anesthetic solutions. And that's why uh, the rest of the studies did not see the association of epidural with the assisted vaginal word. Epidural analgesia had no impact on the risk of C-section or long-term backache and did not appear to have an immediate effect on the neonatal stre uh, stress as indicated by the APGAR scores or admission to the NICO. And again, why I am sharing this? So that you guys would be better geared to answer the questions which are either posed by your OBGYN teams or by the patients themselves that epidural doesn't have any adverse relationship on uh, these factors. Then there was a, another Cochrane systematic review, and this one compares the patient-controlled analgesia with remifentanil because now PCIA, which I'm, uh, I'm hope that you guys are aware with the term patient-controlled intravenous analgesia, which we use a lot after the major abdominal surgeries or any kind of major surgeries. It is also used in case of the labor analgesia, especially in women where neurexal analgesia 
Africa is contraindicated. So remifentanil is has there are so many large studies, you know, large number of studies on PCIA with remifentanil. So what they did, they conducted a, a systematic review of comparison of PCIA with remi with the parent methods for pain management and labor, and they uh, included randomized control trials, cluster control trials, um, and what they found there are outcomes were the patient satisfaction and the occurrence of the adverse effect women who were using ECIA with remifentanil, they were more satisfied with the pain relief than those women who were receiving parenteral opioids. That means if you're giving IA medications to your uh, patient during labor, the, the, the pain relief is not going to be as significant if, as compared to the fact that if you are giving her PCIA. But again, the, the women were less so why I am uh, making all these points because our literature very strongly says that epidural labor analgesia is superior to the rest of the techniques which we use to relieve during labor. And we know that we have not for IM medications, but you, the, the neurexal analgesia is the superior most and these are the large scale studies and hence this led to the who recommendation as well. Now we come to the neurexal analgesia for labor. And as you can see that when we talk about the optimal epidural insertion technique, we know that most of the time we use the blind procedure. We, we go through the anatomical landmarks and our LOR uh, you know, uh, techniques. But sometimes in difficult cases, we may have to resort to ultrasound guidance. Like we do resort to ultrasound guidance for the blocks. Um, we, we do resort to ultrasound guidance for the CVP insertion. We have been trained to, to insert CVP through the landmark techniques or the anatomical techniques, but now the ultrasound is the uh, gold standard. So I don't know, maybe the there a time would come that ultrasound would make a definitive place in central neurexal labor analgesia, but for now, it is mostly for the troubleshooting purposes. And then we have the combined spinal epidural and DPE, and it can be maintained through either the uh, PCEAs or PIEV or local anesthetic solutions. So the scope of this presentation is not to teach ultrasound, but we will highlight it why we have to use ultrasound sometimes for the labor neurexal analgesia. And it is mainly done to identify the midline, especially in those people where they have some, uh, you know, maybe the obesity has shuffled the anatomical landmarks or to localize the epidural space, to measure skin to epidural space distance and to estimate the angle of the needle insertion. So it is very useful in patients with scoliosis, right? And uh, in obesity, it improves the epidural placement learning curve and it helps in development of a difficult spinous score. Now, I really like this article. This is actually published um, by Turkish anesthesiologist. It is about lumbar ultrasonography for obstetric neurexal blocks, sono anatomy and literature view. And this is again published in 2018. And what they say that ultrasonography for neuraxial blocks was found beneficial, especially for determining the correct needle insertion site and estimating the needle insertion depth of the epidural space. In this uh, article, you will find the principles of lumbar ultrasonography, the practical review of it, the impact and benefits, and the limitation of its use in the part theory. So I would strongly advise that after uh, you are done with this talk, you may, um, you know, uh, would like to look into this article and read it. It's, it's, a, it's a nicely written one. Here are some pictures. You can see that uh, uh, how it is placed, you know, uh, at the vertebral column. And then you can appreciate in this first picture, which is labeled as B over here, that if you go from skin to the depth, how will you see that this is a classically uh, appreciated as a flying bed sign. Here you can see the flying bed sign if you adjust the light, right? So these would be the articular processes, and this is going to be the ligamentum flavor, and this is vertebral body, and over here you will find the uh, transverse processes, or, and you're going from skin to the depth. Yeah. Then, um, how the ultrasound uh, is as compared to the palpation method for the neuraxial procedure. So there is an improved efficacy because
see my screen uh Hello. it was not apparent a few minutes ago but now it is clear all right so um so the maternal satisfaction is increased now we talk about combined spinal epidural and as you can appreciate it at one side i have just shown the um cse set combined spinal epidural set so there is one technique which is other surgeries as well so you can place simple epidural in a laboring patient right but you can also uh, do a combined spinal epidural and for that you have a different equipment set over here you can see that this is your epidural needle and this one is the spinal needle which goes through the uh, epidural dr needle. sobia we can't here, see you your see... Uh, presentation sorry dr sobia we cannot see your presentation we can see you but we cannot see the screen yeah. share Uh, so I think Dr. Sobia is having some internet issues, so she will be joining back soon. Uh, kindly stay with us, please. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but we can't see your screen. So kindly share your screen, please. Yeah, it, it goes away again and again. I don't know why it's happening because I did not stop sharing my screen at any time. Is it visible now? Uh, no, it, again, it's not visible. Because I did not stop sharing at all. Okay, so uh, you can send your presentation to any one of us and then we will be, you know, showing it on screen for you. Just WhatsApp me. Yes, now it is apparent. All right. So, you know, the technology and it's just, okay. So coming back. All right. So guys, this is the um, epidural needle and you can see the spinal needle protruding through it. So over here, the catheter would go. And if you would like to inject medication, then it will go into the CSF and your epidural medication will go through your epidural catheter in the epidural space. Now, why we are doing so, why we are discussing it, because um, Although in our country, the, even the rate of the labor epidural is very, very low, but in the world, labor epidural is there since, you know, more than 70 years, or maybe even uh, you can go far, far uh, beyond that. But the world is really shifting towards combined spinal epidurals and the uh, slightly other modified techniques. They no longer use the plain epidural for labor analgesia. So it is it tends to replace the traditional labor epidurals. And what they do is in the when they um, place the CSE in the intrathecal space, they give local anesthetic 2.5 milligrams along with the fentanyl, which tends to relieve the labor pain quicker because now you're injecting some medication directly into the uh, CSF. We can also use opioids alone. We don't have to use the local anesthetic all the time. And if we choose the opioids alone in the CSE technique, then we can actually convert it into a, um, a epidural with hatch, which has minimal or no motor block. Re remember that most of the parturients, they are really, uh, you know, skeptical about the motor block or the loss of the control they have on their legs. So uh, 
even if we use the dilute solutions in a simple epidural analgesia, the chances of motor block are still there. If not completely, then partially it can happen. But if you use opioids in, um, in the CSE, you can convert it into the walking epidural. And we will discuss the walking epidural in our later slides. So if we are using CSE for our parturients and we are using opioids, then there is a chance of fetal bradycardia related to the dose of the spinal opioids. And the chances are that if we use so fentanyl, then it will happen more frequently as compared to the fentanyl. There is a low incidence of dura pancreatic because the material which we are using to uh, puncture the dura is very, very small. And what are the advantages? The advantages is that the CSL helps to confirm the midline. There is a faster onset of analgesia. There is a reduced need for the further boluses. There are few unilateral blocks. There are few catheter failures. And the failure rate of CSE is lesser as compared to the failure rate of a standard epidural. With the standard epidural, we have a failure rate of 12%. It comes down to 7% with CSE. And obviously with all these factors, there is a higher maternal satisfaction. A little bit about walking epidurals, which is labor analgesia, which allows intrapartum ambulation because it preserves the motor function in the laboring parturient. Because of the motor sparing concentrations of local anesthetic solutions, which we use in them. And of course, because of the smaller doses of the opioids or clonidine, if we have uh, in the CSF. And I, I don't think we have clonidine, uh, which is given in intrathecally here. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong later when we discuss it. So ambulation improves the outcome of the labor. Is it true or not? That remains to be seen because there are no convincing studies so far. It, they say that it may affect the rate of the cervical dilatation. It can increase the spontaneous delivery rate. It decreases the aortic cable compression. So it can give rise to a better FR score. And what we do is when we are using it, we use low dose mixture of local anesthetic and opioids. And nowadays, ropivacaine and levobupivacaine uh, they are kind of replacing bupivacaine because they spare the motor function even better. So with this, I would like to share um, this, uh, this, you know, anesthesia tutorial of the V. And uh, this is about, you can say that um, about the ambulatory neurexial analgesia. It was published in April 2021. And it says that ambulatory labor epidurals that preserve motor function have several potential advantages, such as there is a, a lower chance of the instrumental delivery and higher maternal satisfaction, right? Also, they say that how would you achieve it? There are many methods, but now the programmed intermittent epidural boluses give greater sensory dermatolar spread with less motor blockade when compared to the continuous epidural infusion. So these may be the superior techniques. All right. Now we will, we will discuss about the dural puncture epidural DPE versus the epidural. So in case of the DPE, what is happening? What we are doing is we are actually uh, intentionally puncturing the dura again with the same smaller gauge needle, but we don't intend to uh, place any medication in the CSF. So it is actually a what is dural puncture epidural? It is actually a combined spinal epidural without the intrathecal dosing. You are accessing the intrathecal space, but you are not uh, giving any medication over there. We use 25 gauge bitter care versus epidural. So then PCEA, what will happen? Agar aap isko compare kare to, it, is, it has a quicker onset. Uh, it has a quicker onset. It has a less sectoral sparing. It has fewer one-sided blocks. So again, it, it has got the better maternal satisfaction. So CSE is quicker. Um, it gives you effect within two minutes as compared to the dural puncture epidural, which gives its effect in 11 minutes, as compared to the traditional epidural, which gives its effect in 18 minutes. We all know that we place the labor epidural, the simple epidural, then at least 18 to 20 minutes are required for the medication to act. And this time comes down to 11 minutes when you uh, puncture the dura and you allow the medication which you have given in the epidural space to uh, seep through the hole into the uh, CSF. 
and that this is going to happen gradually and that's why this is uh, more than the CSE, but the time duration is lesser than the epidural. Again, pruritus, hypertension, and uterine hypertonus are less as compared to CSE, and PDPH risk has not been well established. So now we come to the labor epidural maintenance technique. So, so far we have discussed the traditional labor epidural. We have discussed the combined spinal epidural um, in which we reach the infothecal space and give medication in the infothecal space as well. We have discussed the dural puncture epidural in which we do puncture the dura, but we do not inject medication into it. Instead, we rely upon the uh, diffusion of the medication from epidural space into the infothecal area. Now we are talking about the labor epidural maintenance technique. And these are the years since you can see that epidural for childbirth birth, world over was used in 1930s. Then what they used to do initially, they were doing the manual bolus, right? Which uh, then changed into the continuous epidural infusion, which we also use in our department and in most of, I think in our country, wherever the epidural is being used. used. Now there are recommendations for PCEA and um, for PIEB, right? Right. I wanted to share this, um, this American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology practice guidelines. Are, these practice guidelines are so detailed. I would really recommend that uh, if you have an interest in the subject, do um, search them and read them. They encompass almost everything. In continuous epidural infusions, the, their guideline says that this delivers a constant rate of a low concentration local anesthetic with or without opioids. This method of analgesia maintenance is effective. However, it places the maternal patient at risk for motor block and weak pelvic mesentone, which may make the second stage of labor more difficult. So now what is the evidence saying to us? That initially I talked to you about that the world is moving away from the simple traditional epidural. And now the world is also moving away from the continuous epidural infusions because they say that it is giving a constant local anesthetic whether you're using opioids or not. So there is a chance of motor block there. There is a chance of weak muscle, pelvic muscle tone there. So the mother won't be able to push and there is a chance of assisted instrumental delivery. So, so it, they, now they are giving us better ways of um, you know, maintenance of epidural. Okay. Let's talk about the patient controlled epidural analgesia. So this is the epidural drug delivery system, which automatically adjusts the background infusion rate based upon the number of PCEA demands. So whatever the demands patient makes to administer herself the analgesia, this uh, this pump adjusts the background infusion. So those women who are on continuous infusion plus PCEA technique, they have same local anesthesia consumption as compared with demand only PCEA. And what it helps, it, uh, it accounts for, uh, it allows an account for variability in women's perception of the pain, a stage in progress of the labor, difference in patient en engagement and preferred degree of analgesia because patient feels in control of her own analgesia. These are two pumps. You can see that this is like an older version because it was like kind of connected with the uh, big laptop because computer uh, algorithms decide upon the number of the uh, um, you know labor energies that demands by the patients to set the background infusion rate. And this is somewhat the smaller version. Then we come to the programmed intermittent epidural. boluses. So local anesthesia is administered as intermittent boluses. A spread algesia irrespective of patient participation. Fentanyl as 2 to 3 mics or so fentanyl as 0.2 to 0.4 mic per ml. Then I would like to share with you the uh, uh, programmed intermittent epidural boluses and its safety concerns because we just discussed that, right? Uh, these, this, there is no continuous infusion over here. The patient is only getting intermittent boluses. And since he's getting intermittent boluses, they, they tend to smoothly spread into the epidural space and they keep providing the baseless analgesia, whatever the patient's participation is. That means there is no uh, control system in terms of the boluses by the patient. So, but what can happen? Uh, if the alarm gets excluded, 
the patient can get unfitness first bolus there can be respiratory depression because of the opioid bolus can be hypertension and the catheter remains untested and maybe the bolus time from the pump can come during the second stage so patient may get motor block or he may have difficulty pushing right so let's see some researches. The one on my left hand side was is actually a systematic review and meta analysis, but it is almost ten years old. But this is was kind of a, it sets set the precedence for the intermittent epidural bolus techniques. And then there were multiple studies which were done. One of them I have shared here with you that PIB plus very low continuous uh, epidural infusion randomized control trial. So they looked at two hundred patients. And they found that the total local anesthetic dose administered was significantly higher in those who were getting programmable epidural boluses. And they found that continuous epidural infusion with the boluses was a good alternative to continuous epidural with the PCEA. So that means the recommendation are coming that uh, you give the background infusion with the programmable um, boluses rather than the patient-controlled epidural analgesia. Let's discuss something or the other about the continuous spinal analgesia and why we are doing so. Because sometimes during labor, we have to uh, give single shot of spinal for analgesia, especially if someone has a previous spinal surgery and epidural space is really difficult to, um, you know, uh, pick that where your epidural space lies. And in those cases where the epidural catheter placement is difficult, for example, if there was an unintended dural puncture. So what if you are placing epidural and unintended puncture occurs, you were placing a traditional epidural and, and dural puncture has occurred. So the one of the uh, methods of managing it is to leave catheter in the intrathecal space. And through this, you can administer continuous spinal analgesia. We can also use in those patients who have significant cardiac disease, and you can give them intrathecal opioids, which will lead to negligible hemodynamic effects. And in those patients where morbid obesity is present, because in these patients, the rate of failed induction, cesarean delivery, and the rate of epidural is much, much higher. So it is advisable to leave, uh, uh, you know, catheters in the intrathecal space and utilize them as continuous spinal analgesia. So this is a review of uraxial labor analgesia. And um, it is why I included over here because it particularly talked about the continuous spinal analgesia via catheters. And they retrospectively studied about 761 intrathecal catheters, which were either intentionally placed or after inadvertent dural puncture. There were no serious complications such as meningitis, abscess, hematomas, arachnoiditis, or cauda equina syndrome. So the recommendation is that we are not supposed to use the microcatheter. Anything less than 20 gauge catheter is not supposed to be left in the intrathecal space. What regimens are used? Uh, we can use intermittent boluses like plain bupivacaine 1.75 to 2.5 milligrams plus fentanyl 15 to 20 micrograms as needed. Or we can use continuous infusion 0.05 to 0.125 to bupivacaine with the fentanyl at 0.5 to 3 mils per hour. And you may appreciate that the, the volume which we are using in continuous spinal analgesia is way, way less as compared to the volume which is given in epidural, right? And we will discuss why there is a difference of this volume later during our discussion. So, um, it is not easy to administer any one continuous spinal analgesia without the risk of um, horrible complications. So there are certain safety guidelines. And if you do not have safety mechanisms in place, for example, a trained nurse, for example, the continuous monitoring, then this should not be done. This should be one of the contraindications if no one knows what to give, how to give, how to monitor, and, and, what, and how to do the troubleshooting. So I have shared these three guidelines. One of them is actually a NHS trust guideline. And, and, you, and you know, in UK, they utilize many guidelines for, uh, they have pathways, they have guidelines, which actually uh, serves the purpose of bringing safety into their system. So this is about care of women with the labor epidural. And this is uh, this was, uh, you know, available for use in 2017. Their last update was also done in 2017 because they make the guidelines and they, after a few years, they keep updating it. This one is the same, which is American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology, because over there in USA, there is a practice of certified nurses who manage the labor epidurals. They do not 
insert labor epidural, but they are the key people in managing labor epidural or in providing the labor epidural energies here through these infusions and boluses. And they are trained for it. So there's a whole guideline on it, which I mentioned before. Then this is a very nice safety guideline on neurological monitoring associated with obstructive neuroxial block, uh, particularly the labor energies here one by the Association of Anesthetists. And it was uh, available in December 2019. So with this, I would like to end my presentation. It's not, it was not a very long one. And I think we will have some room for discussion. And I hope I didn't uh, went very uh, fast with my uh, Thank you. Thank you so very advice. much, uh, Dr. Uh, Sobia, for so such a nice you, and elaborate uh, presentation. Uh, I would I, like to take questions like to from my participants. Here? Yeah, yeah, anywhere. All right, all right, all right. So I would request my participants to kindly ask questions so that uh, we can, you know, uh, proceed on from here. Any questions? Okay, so um, kindly when to insert epidural when the dilatation is four centimeter. There is a... You know, there is kind of a rule for labor epidural insertion. So you have to insert if the patient demands and when the obstetrician approves it. So if the dilatation is four centimeter and the patient is well established into the labor, because sometimes patients are in four centimeter, but the pains are very slow. So you may insert it, but you may not load it. There are, there are two different things. Um, if the patient is in early stage of labor, for example, 1.5 to 2 cm, you can still cite epidural in consultation with her OBGYN if they think that she will progress eventually or they will induce the labor, but you can choose not to load medication into that epidural. And at uh, when the patient is at the early stage, like 1.5 or 2, for example, so this gives you the room that patient cooperates. If she is in, in you know, uh, regular, um, severe pain, then it will be difficult for the patient to cooperate to you for the epidural sighting. So there is another question by Mohammed Imran, Dr. Sobia. He's asking about the minimum platelet count on which an spinal can uh, an epidural can be inserted. Okay, so um, so these are the very very basic guidelines, and I um, I was hoping that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great question, obviously, but I was hoping that the audience I have, ranging from year one residents to year four or year five re residents, um, would know the, the basics of contraindications of central neuroaxial blocks and the limits when to go for it and when not to go for it. So for a spinal, usually we, uh, if, you're, if you're going for spinal in any patient, the cutoff of a platelet count is 70. But for epidural, since the bigger needle is being used, so the cutoff of platelets is 100. It's as advisable not to go for epidural placement if the platelet count is below 100. And there is another question by Zishan Ahmad, and he's asking, please comment on epidural analgesia in patients for VBAC. Should it be avoided or proceeded with special precautions and also share spinal analgesic dose? So um, I don't see any harm of uh, uh, using epidural for VBAC. Uh, why would we avoid? If the patient is going for VBAC, that means she is willing to undergo the labor process. And um, if she expects us to uh, give analgesia, and if she is willing for epidural, and if he, her OBGYN is not against epidural, again, I'm saying because it's a teamwork. When we are doing epidurals, we are doing it, we are maintaining it, but it's a teamwork with our nurse as well as with our OBGYN people, right? So if they're allowing it, there's no harm of placing epidural to these patients. We all know that VBACs have chances of failure and VBACs can turn up into cesarean sections. So that is mm. actually going to give you an added advantage because your epidurals would already be in place. So if that patient rushes into the OR, you can actually top it up and use it for your uh, surgical anesthesia. Mm. I hope it answers your question. Yes, I think uh, you have adequately uh, answered. Actually, uh, actually, but, yes. uh, what we face is that OB uh, obstetricians say that there is risk of 
uh, scar tenderness, that the scar tenderness would not be visible if patient is having epidural. So they want to completely avoid it. They know in VPAC patients, epidural should not be given, though the patient does uh, need some kind of analgesia. So in that respect. The, th the thing is, uh, you have really, um, you know, raised a, a matter, which is kind of a conflict, I would say, in our practices. But if you carefully look at the contraindications of, um, you know, labor epidural. So those contraindications take into account the many factors. I have never read VBAC as one of the contraindications of labor epidural because it will mask the, the scar tenderness. Have you? Naina? So I think the, uh, we can, again, we can, you know, uh, make a, our argument or make our point with the OBGYN, but since at the end of the day, they are managing the patient, it's their patient. So we have to respect their choices. What we can do is we can share the articles with them. We can share the recent studies with them. We can try to convince them with the logic and with the physiology, etc. Because these guidelines, which we are uh, uh, reading over here, which I shared with you, all over the world, they are the shared um, property. They are in the department. So it is accessible to anyone, right? So I think the um, the the convincing them through these matters is the only way out. Otherwise, it is not a written communication anywhere. All right. So I uh, see next question. Uh, does it, I skipped your name? Very sorry. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Zishan. Zishan Ahmed. Dr. Zishan, yes. yes. Dr. Zishan, is it okay with you? Would you like to add upon something? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, is uh, the guidelines, uh, I, I didn't get the guidelines. Is it shared in the group or in the email? Is, is it the app guide guidelines? No, the different guidelines, you know, uh, for the different clinical practice guidelines, for example, the NHS trust guidelines, for example, the, the US guidelines. So in USA, different states, they have their own practice guidelines, but the basics remain the same, right? The basics do not differ. Right. The practices differ. So I was talking about those. Right. So there is Thank one you. question, kindly share spinal analgesia dose. So spinal analgesia dose for uh, labor analgesia is, is obviously not the one which we use for the surgical anesthesia. So typically it is, uh, if you're using bupivacaine, uh, hyperbaric bupivacaine, so you, you can give 2.5 to 3 milligrams to uh, cover the pain. And, and we give the spinal analgesia usually when the patient present late to us and they seek help for their labor pains. For example, if someone is requesting pain relief, is not able to bear it, and she is already six, uh, you know, seven centimeters or so, and she is multi, and you know that she will eventually deliver maybe in one hour, maybe in one and a half hour at the most, then it's best to give the single short spinal, right? Uh, and and um, with this dose, there is obviously sacral area goes, the, the sacral area is covered, but, but the legs are not. So still they would be able to move, keep their legs on the stirrups and, you know, to uh, come in the birthing position. Um, I found one question during epidural insertion, if the tip is broken inside that what would be the next strategy? I think this is something uh, which is going to be a, a catastrophe, obviously, because um, something has left inside the body. And I, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this, uh, after, because once you withdraw the catheter and you see the tip is not there, um, then what will you do? You will send the patient for the scanning. You will involve the neurosurgeon and you will tell the patient, you will tell the, the family, uh, you will notify it, you will document it. But obviously you will try your best to uh, help out the patient. And the help is obviously going to be the surgical one because you don't know that whatever the broken piece is, is left, where it actually is residing where it will eventually lodge. So you have to go for the scanning and you have to involve the neurosurgery. I hope, uh, uh, Dr. Danish, I, am, I have answered your question. Is Dr. Danish here? Uh, yes, yes, sorry. Uh, I was engaged somewhere. Actually, if during the labor pain and we are expecting to be, uh, the lady should be delivered, at that time, definitely will not go for the surgical intervention. We have, what I have to know, uh, come to know that, we have to try uh, one limit upper for the epidural to be proceed, and then we'll go for the scanning and the neurosurgical consultation 
because first we have to address the patient came for that primarily uh, with the labor or uh, with this for the cesarean all right sorry i i think i didn't get your question correct and please excuse me for that because i missed the point during epidural insertion of the tibus broken inside so, so you see uh, uh dr danish i would really be very i'm very intrigued you did how would you know that during epidural insertion that tip has broken inside you would never you have placed the tip inside you are threading the catheter you're not withdrawing it you would never know right and you have given the medication and everything I, to i think the only way to know that the epidural tip has broken the catheter tip has broken when you have withdrawn it you can't see it when you are placing it isn't it dr dan yes sir would like to come up with uh, no 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 so to some extent agree? i do agree with you uh, but because we are discussing the scenario if we can say it's not the tip might be some extent more the point is that at that time what would be our strategy the thing is that so uh, again again my my stance is again the same that whatever the length i have threaded inside the patient and if it gets broken i would never be able to know because i have so much length behind me now and I, the only thing is that i'm doing it forward right so if something is shredding i would not know i will only know once the whole thing has been withdrawn i will see from where it has shred i really don't think that we would be able to know while we are inserting the labor epidural catheter uh this is what you are talking when you are successfully going inside the space but what we have tried many time we are not getting the space so at that time we have to take and pull it back and it can be accidentally happen at that time as well all right so so obviously if if you are withdrawing it after the unsuccessful attempt and you find that the tip is broken so obviously you are going to address the patient first first you are going to relieve her pain you are going to inform her that this complication has occurred we are going to place another new epidural in you but we will take you for the scans and you will seek the opinion of your surgeon and so on and so forth yeah in that scenario it will happen then so the next question comes from dr hafiz if labor fails and you need to go for c section what drugs and dose should be given for surgical anesthesia dr hafiz uh, i can obviously answer you over here but i will strongly recommend you to refer to your textbooks because in case of the straight forward labor epidurals the textbooks which you guys are using to to read anesthesia has in detail uh, about the traditional labor epidural insertion technique how to initiate the labor epidural analgesia how to maintain the labor and uh, epidural analgesia and how to convert it into the surgical anesthesia so you know it will be your, like your take away uh, uh, homework as well if you would like to see in this because i can tell you like you know in an instant but you may or may not be able to even remember it because this is like a whole topic so i think uh, it would be nicer and it would help you in retention more if you uh, read it yourself however if the labor fails and if you take the patient for cesarean section then what we do is we have to convert this labor analgesia into the surgical anesthesia and we, we give the patient a uh, xylocaine as well as the bupivacaine we first check at which level patient's uh, dermatomal level is you know in terms of the sensory blockade and how much level we require to uh, bring it to uh, you know um, t4 levels and then we um, load it accordingly for example in general you do need about uh, 10 to 20 mls of xylocaine and bupivacaine combined and you can combine them in the single syringe in this way the xylocaine becomes 1% and bupivacaine becomes 2.5% and it gives you the surgical anesthesia for cesarean section we come to mohammed imran and he says that how much time will it take for a top up to take effect or bring the motor effect once labor analgesia is going to be converted to anesthesia so mohammed imran this there is no set answer to it you know why because every patient differs one patient is different from the other patient so the 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 time when a patient is wheeled into the or it will depend how much of the uh, good epidural was was it working for her for the labor what was the sensory level at the time she was wheeled into the or 
what are her body's response to the local anesthetic which you're giving to her because the depends upon the binding of local anesthetic to to the proteins right so it will be different for each patient but in general if you talk about that labor energy is receiving continuous epidural infusion and now sudden fetal time it takes is way less than the time which is typically 15 to 20 minutes is is already filled with the epidural to be around 10 minutes or so hopefully not more than that is the uh, i hope i have answered your question dr Mira. So um, there is a question from Dr. Zishan Ahmad Chatta. Is the PCA pump different than the PCA pump used for IV? Okay, so patient controlled epidural analgesia pump is, is different than the PCIA pump, yes. The, the pump which we use for intravenous patient controlled analgesia, it is different from the PCA pumps. And uh, I would share that in our uh, hospital, we do have PCIAs. And still, we do not have PCEAs because if there was if there were same pumps and if they were working in the same way, we would we would have just used the PCIA for the epidural, but it doesn't work like that because PCA pump has different programming in it. Um, I hope I have answered your query, Dr. Zishan. So, can I move to another question by Dr. Bushra Jamali? Yes, please. Thanks. So Bushra says that, can we give a spinal anesthesia in lateral decubitus position to the patient who is undergoing C-section and then turn to supine afterwards, especially when the patient is in active labor and not cooperating? 200%. And this is what we almost always do, Bushra, because when the patient is in severe pain, she is not going to cooperate. She is not going to set it up for us. So it's best to turn her because she can turn. And then you place uh, you know, a spinal there for the labor analgesia. Uh, give her the doses, the reduced doses, which are used in labor analgesia for uh, spinal, and then make her supine, right? So whatever you have written is absolutely correct. So if I remove can from your from your text, it becomes the answer, right? Can saddle block work in second stage of labor? All right. So uh, saddle block work in second stage of labor? So for this, for this, I would just again say, Dr. Naeem, that if you know the physiology and if you know the pain pathways which are at work during the labor, we may not be asking this question, right? Because when the labor sets in, for the initial part, the pain is abdominal. But when the labor progresses and the second stage sets in, the pain progresses to the saddle area, but it doesn't leave the, the above area. So we have to cover now from th thoracic dermatomes till the sacral dermatomes, right? So that's why saddle block is not supposed to work there. Thank you, Dr. Azar, for your um, appreciation. And is there any question I would love to answer, guys? Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Uh, Sobia. I joined the discussion late. Uh, yes. So I have a number of things. I just want to, um, by the way, welcome I'm... Dr. Zishan and Dr. Sovia. Dr. Zishan is one of our very, uh, uh, I would say, very enthusiastic teacher in his own self. He's one of those persons who has been conducting online lectures for a very long time, not from the PSA platform, but generally and on other groups. So he is a very great teacher and a learner himself. So I would uh, really thank Dr. Zishan to come on uh, to be here uh, today joining us and uh, Dr. Zishan please uh, uh, give some thanks talk a lot, uh, Dr. Aspa for your nice words actually <clears throat> I just uh, I just have a comment rather you you can say it's a question which is uh, touching my mind I'm, I'm not able to do it myself but I think uh, we, we, we can just use this forum to discuss this idea um, erector spiny block has got a lot of uh, fame in uh, in the uh, in the recent past, and in a, no a number of surgeries where we used to have epidurals, uh, we mm -hmm. are replacing it with the erector spiny block. Okay, especially in hepatobiliary surgery where they are 
doing not uh, the open technique they are using the laparoscopic assisted technique and actually they are not because i think they have also understood that uh, opia uh, the epidural is uh, is hindering uh, towards their path for iras okay so my question is that that uh, have you people ever ever thought okay. of using a single shot or uh, keeping a catheter for liver analgesia instead of epidural using erector spinae block for liver analgesia especially in the first stage of liver because in the last stage of liver maybe the conventional epidural sometimes is not that much effective and you can top up with uh, with, uh, with some, some uh, saddle block but uh, what about what like what will be your opinion using erector spinae block for liver analgesia in first stage of liver all right thank you so very much for this uh, question dr zishan and let me admit one thing uh, in front of all of you that in my lifetime so far i have never done erector spinae block i know that this is something which is actually replacing many alternative analgesia techniques as you have said in hepatectomies because um, and many other blocks especially the central neuroaxial block in the major surgeries but i have not done erector spinae in the non obstetric procedures and i have zero experience and even this never came to my mind so and i if i am not mistaken when i was doing literature search for my presentation i did not come across the uh, with the use of erector spinae in the liver analgesia so so just uh, asking out of my curiosity have you come across any study or you know any, um, even a single center study please no, share because i'm here to learn as well and uh, no no you are absolutely right but I'm, you know i am just talking total i have never searched by the way uh, but uh, logically <clears throat> we just need in labor analgesia we want around from t10 to l2 l3 and uh, if you are giving erector spinae block in a lower part actually theoretically it will uh, it will it should be covering that part which is going towards uh, the uterus okay and uh, then if we can just of course this is this is sort of you can say a little different sort of thing Uh, because epidural itself is you know epidural is not as good as people we are by uh, selling it by the way epidural is is a much invasive procedure we are entering into the into a very dangerous area and you never know uh, though it is one in 200000 or one in 150000 you never know what's uh, waited for you in a new patient so because actually i have Uh, i have been working in hospitals where uh, like it was too much busy and they were not interested in putting epidurals so i have used personally single shot epidural uh, so single shot erector spinae blocks for incisions uh, even covering up to like uh, uh, umbilicus and even blow umbilicus and uh, the, i don't have the experience of putting the catheters but i was just thinking you you can just have a yes you can say this is just a food for thought for you Uh, you are working in pakistan you have more liberty and because in saudi arabia we are afraid of a number of uh, medical legal issues and we are not uh, playing as freely as we can do in pakistan where we have uh, more liberty to express ourselves in some ways so this is just a, an idea um, uh, uh, dr zishan someone has rightly answered but, uh, in fact had a comment on your talk that because if we uh, proceed with the bar, uh, erector spinae then we'll have to insert it bilaterally Uh, whereas course, epidural yeah. is usually uh, inserted uh, via first even, in one break even, actually you know, doctor, and uh, uh, doctor asma sorry to interrupt you because actually even if you don't put a catheter forget about catheter if you are because erector spinae block is one of the most easiest block to perform uh, if you have a little bit of knowledge of ultrasound because there is a bony uh, landmark even you don't need anything i have like i i can just share that we can do it with the simple 20 cc syringe ultrasound clean the area and just you will touch the bone and that's it so there is uh, always doctor, a chance it will sorry sorry complete kind dr zishan and i just have a comment on it please do yes. complete yes yes yeah. like like you can do it uh, with the 20 cc syringe in the lower thoracic area okay uh, like uh, if you just uh, count the lowest possible rib and then just try to do it over there because it's a bony uh, landmark and usually that that area is not that much deep so even you don't need the the block needle you can use just a 20 cc syringe and it is like uh, it is uh, possible if you have like because you will be just uh, focusing the rib and you can do it this is just i'm i'm not saying that i have done it myself 
but i i was just uh, this uh, idea is just touching my mind a number of times so i just wanted to share it with you thank you uh, dr azhar has some comment as well uh, dr azhar no, dr would you please have a comment uh, if yes you... yes so um, again i obviously i just, just like i told you i don't have experience of rectus spiny but was i'm just, uh, you know thinking is that isn't like if you have to do rectus spiny bilaterally in a pregnant patient right you will have to use a lot of local anesthetic over there because in epidurals the amount of local anesthetic which we are using which is going in the epidural space obviously it is different when you are using it in rectus spiny area what about the absorption what about the speed with which it will reach the systemic circulation what about the total amount of the local anesthetic for the mother and the baby these this leaves a lot of questions in my mind right now and also just as a comment that no one is selling central neuralgia epidural block there is a who recommendation and obviously who recommendation after loads of these gone uh dr sobia i think we are having uh, internet uh, issues with your connection dr azhar you had any comment on this ah uh, yeah thank you uh, obviously this is a very important point uh, because for erector spiny block we need a higher volume usually around 30 to 40 ml on each side so uh, we have to give a maximum dose but another important question is does it provides visceral analgesia or not this is a very important question and up till date there is no guideline that recommends the erector spiny block for the liver analgesia so it's it's not a part of standard practice up till now uh, maybe possibly after few hours it may become a part of standard of care but up till up till date these are the questions which are very important and there are few studies which were conducted uh, there are few case series in which erector spiny block with a catheter uh, was placed um, in those studies uh, they uh, they did the erector spiny block because uh, because of the fear of bleeding the patient uh, had uh, thrombocytopenia uh, that's why they uh, experimentally they placed the uh, erector spiny block so up to date it is not uh, recommended as a standard practice um labor epidural is still the uh, standard practice up to now thank you uh thank you so much dr azhar um uh dr sobia are you still there if you are still there then we can have uh, more questions uh, yeah i think she has left uh, dr asma actually that's what i because i i i admit myself that neither i have done it nor i am saying that it's right, a right. standard i understand I just, that it I was just, just a query thinking. and just a comment yes, 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 yes. yes. actually actually you know sometimes uh, uh, even if you are working in a very good hospital unfortunately you don't get that much ideas because here life is totally different in saudi arabia life yeah, is totally different than after than working in an institute like uh, like a like a very like a very academic institute in pakistan that's a, that's which the thing which i actually miss and uh, you are absolutely right about the volume and bilateral but i'm just saying thinking that sometimes uh, if uh, like these things maybe today it's it's not practical maybe someone try i was just searching maybe there are some case series which are being done yes. and because uh, the one question was just uh, discussed that will, will it cover some visceral part so actually it will cover because there you are blocking the nerve from they are coming so mm -hmm. uh, i think it, it began it because the uh, erector spiny whenever they are we are injecting it is migrating through epid paravertebral space as well so there is some visceral uh, coverage as well that's uh, that's thank that's right uh, thank you so much dr uh, zishan for your input maybe you can do a case report or a case, case series afterwards and once it gets published then you know a study can be done over it but i really thank you for your comments and uh, i would like to also thank dr sobia was not present right now but at least she took her time out for her presentation and gave us an on uh, insight on the uh, labor epidural uh, at the same time i would request all of uh, the participants to kindly fill in the feedback form to uh, to to get the e certificate so uh, feedback form is uh, is already been shared on the group Uh, in the chat and dr asman last last comment that i just saw some some brochure 
in which it was written that a youtube channel is finally being launched for psa and yes, all the yes yes so have. there is a great so news a, for everyone <laughs> yes there is a great news for everyone because everyone used to because i, I actually I, uh, i am lucky that wakas is doing it for me uh, yeah. he is uh, spreading it because these days i have changed my hospital now i have, i also have become neutral so i am in a mil- military hospital so right. my routine has totally changed and mm-hmm. another message just by the way i am a little bit detracted i right now i'm suffering from covid a very severe actually symptoms really? are much really uh, covid is yes. like something which was yes, extinct yes, from yes. it was people thought to be extinct people, people have forgotten and i am suffering uh, I have more uh, musculoskeletal and uh, not alhamdulillah respiratory symptoms but uh, the musculoskeletal symptom the myalgias and pain much worse than it was 2 years ago when i had first attack so this is just a message covid is we still not we wish you over. a very uh, soon and a, a healthy recovery and okay. speedy Thank recovery you. actually so yes you are very right you have uh, you have uh, read it rightly that we are launching the youtube channel uh, actually there is a conference 41st annual conference which is to be held on t- 12, 11th and 12th of march uh in next week's time like you know we have five days left and inshallah on the day one in the aug- inaugural session we will be uh, launching the psa youtube channel and hopefully we will try to get the sessions uh with the live streaming so let's see we are still working on that but hopefully all the lectures which every one of you have attended would be uh, given on in on that uh, channel hopefully inshallah soon So thank you everyone for joining today's uh, lecture and uh, kindly fill in the feedback form and thank you so much take care uh, Dr Zishan and take care everyone stay healthy stay blessed